you will surely drift away. There's a song out on the ocean.
There's power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name. Help me say it. There's power in the name of Jesus. So much power. Power in the name. Come on, say it again. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Power. old song, but just before we go, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Call him Master, Savior, Jesus. It's like a fragrance after the rain. Oh my 
God. They'll all, mm, they'll pass away. But there's something, woo, Jesus, I can't explain it, but there's something. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but there's sometimes something happens when I say his name and, and I can't comprehend it and I can't explain it, but there is, there is. Something shifts in the atmosphere. There is something, 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 something. Something about that name. Can you worship him right now? Oh, come on and worship. Come on and worship. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The name of Jesus. Something about that name. I mean, you've heard Eli Rios, Bonnie Lopez. That'd be great entertainment. That'd be Great praise team, fabulous musicians. That'd be, that'd be a pretty good Friday night anywhere. People buy tickets for that. But what makes the difference is the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, the presence of the Lord. That's where you get transformation. That's where you get, that's where you get healing, miracles. That's where lives change. Hallelujah. And that's what we're after. And that Jesus wrote a book, Word of God. And tonight we're so privileged to have our Vice President of the Apostolic Assembly, Brother Philip Salazar, Pastor Philip Salazar, Bishop Philip Salazar, I don't know how many titles he has. He has all kinds of, he, has, he came a few years ago. We had, we had a Spanish, we had a few years of Spanish preaching conference, Spanish end time restoration. And that's the first time I'd met him. And he came and preached at our Spanish End Time Restoration. T tonight he's here to preach the Word of God at End Time Restoration 2019. Let's welcome him and welcome the presence of the Lord again to End Time Restoration to preach the Word of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 16. I'm so grateful for being here this, this, um, this evening. Thank God for the privilege. It is an honor to be here in this, in this conference. I want to thank God for Pastor Lopez and for Bishop Lopez and for every one of the preachers that have preceded me. What an amazing word we have received during this conference. We thank God for shall follow them that believe and so my message is very simple for you this um, this evening I just want to preach to you believe it and and I'm I may not be well I'm not gonna say what I'm not gonna be I oftentimes lie at the beginning of my sermons so let's pray father we thank you for the Word of God and thank you for these moments they're sacred they're holy moments when we have the privilege of coming before you lord presenting ourselves as vessels to receive the word of the lord i pray in the name of jesus today that you would do your will in this place that you would minister to our hearts and to our lives in jesus holy name we pray and everyone says amen, amen. you may be seated <clears throat> so let me begin today by making a statement and then asking a question and I think the statement for this, for the beginning of this message is simply this. We believe in miracles. We believe in miracles. Everyone want to say that with me? We believe in miracles. I also want to ask a question this afternoon. And that is, how many of you came to this conference 
anticipating or asking or hoping for a miracle. Is there anybody here that just came expecting, asking the Lord for a miracle? And I'm going to tell you guys something about myself. I've, you know, we all have favorite Bible figures and, and people that we identify with in the scriptures. I'm not a Peter. Bishop Prado's a Peter. He has those tendencies. I always identify myself as a Thomas. I tend to like to think things through. I'm not a doubter when I don't need to be a doubter, but I like information. And I like, um, I like to be able to, to think things through. And so that sometimes is a benefit and sometimes it's a deficit. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't help. That's just who I am. God made me that way by nature. In fact, all of the disciples with all of their different characters and dispositions were made that way particularly to accomplish some purpose in the kingdom of God. Amen. And so I don't uh, complain about that often to the Lord. I'd like to be a Peter. But so for me to believe certain <clears throat> aspects of, of the kingdom working particularly in my life or when I see it working in the lives of others has been at times a challenge. It's been a bit of a, of a challenge. I'm, I think and I analyze when people are working in the gifts of the Spirit and I judge the things that are being done. And I've had this hunger in my heart for many years now to see a genuine and a true move of God. Aside from all the things that are sometimes done and that, and that sometimes happen in our pulpits and in our platforms and in our temples, I've had this hunger just to come into contact with, with a move of God that is so powerful and so pure that it's undeniable. And the challenge for me all of my life has been not to believe that our God is a God of miracles. I believe that our God is a God of miracles. But the challenge for me has been to believe that those miracles that God does and has done throughout the history of the church are things that will regularly work in the ministry that God has given to me. And, um, and so today what I want to do is I want to I have you take a journey with me in some of the the investigations or some of the ideas that have run through my mind, some of the struggles that I've had in trying to get to a place where I am wholly believing that the miracles that I hear and read about in the scriptures and those that I have seen in my life and ministry are something that are to be happening on a regular basis in my ministry and the ministry of our church there in Compton, California. And so... I want to start this message affirming what the Bible teaches and what I believe is true. I believe in miracles. And this message is if, I, I believe that, well, let, let me back up here for a second. A couple of weeks now I've been thinking about this conference and praying and asking the Lord about it. And uh, it was maybe about a week ago or so ago when I was, uh, meditating and praying about this conference. And we were in a church service there in Compton, and the Spirit of the Lord was moving in a special way that the Lord spoke to me about this conference. And here's what he told me to tell the Apostolic Assembly pastors. He says this, If we ask for the miraculous move of God, he'll give us a miraculous move of God. And that, that doesn't seem like anything really deep or anything really significant, except that I think, and, 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 and uh, I think that, that what God is, was speaking to me, at least at that moment, was this. You have not, in fact, this is the way that it came to me initially. He says, you have not because you ask not. And you don't see because you don't act in those areas, in those dimensions. And I thought about my ministry. I thought about many years that I've been a pastor, 25 years now. And I thought about my altar calls. And I thought about the times that I've prayed with individuals. 
and with people. And I, I thought about how many times out of all of those years of ministry that I have I made it a regular practice to, to pray people through to a breakthrough or to a miracle. Have I not just confessed belief in God, in the miraculous workings of God, in, in the scriptures and in the church, but have I taken that another step forward and not just believed with my mind and with my heart, but have I taken it to the place where I am regularly praying in my local church for miracles, signs, and wonders, and a great move of God in an extraordinary way? And I was challenged. I was challenged. I'm a Thomas, not a Peter. And so I've I've rationalized for many years in my mind that I'm a teacher. That's what I am. I love teaching. I, I think I do it well. And um, that's my place in the kingdom. I'm not a miracle worker. I'm not a person that, that moves in that area, in that dimension. And I understand that there's giftings in the church and, and particular gifts that God has given to particular individuals where the Spirit of God manifests itself in a powerful and in a dynamic way, in ways that it does not, uh, with the same frequency and strength, manifest itself in others that are also in the kingdom. We, the kingdom of God moves by gifts, by gifts. But, but there's scriptures in the Bible that trouble me. Scriptures that won't, won't allow my, my mind to rationalize away a, a light or a superficial um, um, uh, experience with the supernatural move of God. And this is one of those scriptures. These signs shall follow them that believe. That means that every one of us that are part of the kingdom of God in one way or another are called to experience, to experience, I believe the scripture says, on a regular basis uh, through the name of Jesus Christ, the supernatural work of God. And so, I have come today just to risk. I'm not going to play it safe today. At the end of my message, I want to pray for healing and miracles in this house. And I'm going to ask the Lord. I've been asking the Lord, and I'm asking him here publicly today. If you're saying, God, that the problem is we're not asking, and that's why we're not receiving then I'm asking tonight, I want to see signs and wonders and miracles break out in the house tonight. Now, I believe that in the apostolic assembly, we pastors have to restore some things. We are apostolic in doctrine, and we're Pentecostal, as Pastor Bernard and Pastor uh, and, and Bishop, rather, uh, Fortino, were explaining to us yesterday. We believe in the Word of God, the absolute, inerrant Word of God, and we believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. And if you've got part of the message, you don't have all of the message. We heard that message last night, and I want to be an apostolic in every sense that you can possibly be an apostolic. And that means that we believe the doctrine of the name of Jesus and we believe in the movement of the power of God in every service, in our lives, every day. Anybody here just... So there are some here today that need a miracle and I'm going to encourage you to believe. I'm going to encourage you as you sit there today listening to the word of God to anticipate a movement of God in your body, in your life. I, 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 I would encourage you right now, if you've got pain in your body, just to go ahead and put your hand wherever that pain is in your body and just anticipate that as the Word of God, the living, the powerful, the almighty Word of God is being preached right now and in a few moments by Pastor Woodward, Evangelist Woodward, that God is going to do a work in your life and miracles, signs, and wonders are going to happen. Somebody give the Lord a hand, praise, and just believe with me right now that God is about to do a great work. We, we have not because we ask not, and so I've made up my mind, in fact, over the last, uh, uh, the last uh, couple of years, the Lord has been ministering to me and dealing with me, and I'm sorry that I take all this time to talk about myself, but um, I've been, I, I, I'm breaking away 
from my old routines. And in Hosanna Apostolic Church, I'm beginning to play, pray for people, and I'm risking. I'm not a risk taker. I, I'm a, I, I walk in the safe grounds. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't go to places where I, I can't understand, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have enough information, but God has just been kind of pushing me towards the edge. And uh, we've been praying for people and asking them to come up and what do you feel and, 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 and where's the pain? And then we pray for them. And is the pain gone? And asking actual questions that demonstrate that you're willing to risk because you really believe this message and that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I pray for people and say, how do you feel? They say, well, yeah, it doesn't hurt as much. And I, I tell them, don't, don't, don't feel like you have to tell me something that I want to hear. Don't, don't feel that way. If you still feel pain, tell me you still feel pain. That's the Thomas in me. You see, I'm not, I'm not hungry for, for something that might have been a miracle, for something that could have been a healing. I want to see a movement of the power of God in the apostolic assembly. I want to see something that is so absolutely certain and so absolutely sure that no one's going to be able to doubt that it was God that was moving in that place and in that individual and in that person. I'm hungry for a miraculous move of God at Hosanna Church and I'm hungry for a movement of God in the apostolic assembly. Somebody give the Lord a hand praise. Now, let me say this. Christianity is a miraculous faith. It's not like Buddhism. It's not like Islam. It's not like the other religions of the world. We, we are Christians. We believe in the name of Jesus Christ. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name and his name. We believe in the name of Jesus. Christianity is the one religion in the world that is inseparably bound to the miraculous. Buddhism, for example, uh, is, a, is a religion, is an atheistic religion. In fact, I was surprised some uh, months ago listening to an, a debate, an atheist and a Christian, and, and the uh, atheist was, was explaining how that he is Buddhist by faith. And there he tries to find some sort of realization, a connection with the ethereal. And I was, I was a bit surprised. But, a, but Buddhism is a... It's an atheistic religion, although there are some that say that uh, the more radical elements of Buddhism, that, that Buddha did do certain miracles. But the truth is that if you removed the miracles that are attributed to Buddha, it wouldn't make a difference. Or if you said, okay, well, we'll give them a miracle or two, even though they're farce miracles, it doesn't make a difference to the religion because... Buddhism is an atheistic religion. It doesn't need miracles to survive. The religion and the faith of Buddhism doesn't require for the existence of miracles. In fact, Buddha taught not the supernatural but the natural. And so Buddhism doesn't need the manifestation of the supernatural. In fact, Islam is the same way. There are some that attribute miracles and, and, and signs to, to, uh, to uh, Muhammad. But the truth, again, is this, that nothing would be lost if you would take away the, quote-unquote, miracles that were attributed to that false prophet, Muhammad. The religion of Islam with a prophet teaching the dogma and the doctrine that he did without miracles or with miracles, it doesn't make a bit of difference because the doctrine of Islam does not depend on miracles. But the Christian faith does, my brothers. You can have an apostolic church without miracles. You see, miracles are bound. They're, 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 they're woven into the very fi fiber and the fabric of the apostolic faith. The Christian faith is the one religion in the entire world that cannot be separated from the miraculous. Think about this just for a moment. That Christianity is the belief that, that someone from beyond time and space, which is uncreated, came into our natural world and took upon himself a human nature 
Then he died upon the cross and he rose again. My friend, if there's anything miraculous, that's miraculous. The truth is that Christianity cannot be separated from the great miracle of the, Chris, of the, of the Christian story. The gospel story begins with the Holy Ghost coming upon a virgin young lady and conceiving a child in her, in her womb. That's the beginning of our story. It's a miracle. Someone yell, it's a miracle. When you talk about the Christian story, it began with the miraculous. And the very end of the Christian story or the story of Christ here on earth ends with the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, conquering the greatest enemy that man has ever encountered. Listen, my brothers, apostolics are believers in miracles we believe in the miraculous work of God we believe in the power of the Holy Ghost moving in our midst and doing things that are beyond our ability to understand and to conceive someone give them praise The question is, can we have a, a, a Christianity, an apostolic faith without miracles? And the answer is no. The conversion experience says no. In fact, the conversion experience is completely dependent on miracles. The change that every one of us have experienced in this place when Jesus Christ came into our lives is nothing short of a glorious miracle. The washing of our dirty sins, the transformation of our wretched lives, the breaking of the addictions that had a hold of our hearts and our minds, the healing of our minds and the curing of our hearts and our emotions. It was all a miracle. Miracle. Jesus brought us out of alcoholism and he brought us out of all kinds of ideas and he brought us out of all kinds of sin. He stepped into our lives and he broke every bondage that was binding us to poverty and to being stricken by the badness of the world. Jesus delivered us from it all. I want to tell you that the Christian faith, the apostolic faith begins and it ends with the miraculous. We believe in miracles. Now, let me give you guys a definition. Probably not a good thing to do here. I'll do it anyway. A miracle is this. It's, I agree. I agree in part with what, with what Oxford says. He says it's a miraculous event occurring in human, within human experience that cannot be brought about by human power or by the operation of any human agency and must therefore be ascribed to a special intervention. I agree with all of that, except for this, of the deity or some supernatural being. It's not a deity and it's not any supernatural being. If ever there's going to be a miracle that's going to bring glory to the name of God, it's going to be through the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel of Christ. Someone give him praise right now. Come on, give him praise. Is there anybody believing that our God is a God of miracles? That our God is a God of power? And that if you're bound by sickness or you're bound by something that you can't make free from, right now in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Word of God can set you free right there where you are in the name of Jesus. We live in an enlightened society that is arguing against miracles. They don't believe that they exist. In fact, did you know that the greatest, the fastest growing religion in the United States is secularism? It's a religion. They have ideas about God and they have ideas about faith and they've got all of those tenets to their religion. Atheism is the greatest and fastest growing religion in our more and more secularized society. And every one of our young people that are going to universities and colleges, it's not a university problem anymore. It's from elementary school all the way up to higher education. They're being influenced 
infiltrated. They're being indoctrinated with doctrines of devils that cause them to doubt the miraculous and the powerful move of God. Somebody say amen. Listen, my brothers, that's why it's so important that from the time that they're young children, they're 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, it's important to bring them up to apostolic altars and have them filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. They need to get in connection with God and get the power of the Spirit of God working in their hearts and in their minds. We're living in a time where atheists and, and secularists are doubting the miraculous. In fact, let me give you their argument against miracles. Here's the way it goes. Number one, God does not exist. Atheism. Number two, the only thing that is true is nature, naturalism. Number three, nature is run by fixed, unalterable, inalterable laws. Number four, every square inch of the universe is filled with the laws of physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology. These laws that are unalterable, that cannot be changed. And then number five, mankind is absolutely subject as part of creation to those laws, these laws, they say, cannot be broken. They're inalterable. They cannot be changed. The law of, of, of entropy that is essentially everything is going from order to disorder and eventually ends in death and in dysfunction. There is no breaking of those laws and every one of the universities or the majority of them and the, uh, the, 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 the secular education that there is in the world is teaching and indoctrinating our children that there is no miraculous working in this world that is controlled by nature and that is composed only of nature they have rejected the supernatural. They say the natural laws are inseparable and invariant. They are all intertwined when they talk about the laws of nature and working in perfect harmony. And that's, that's correct. Each law has its specific duties. Amazing. They create and guide matter and energy of the universe. Every cubic inch, they say, of the universe contains all of nature's laws. And so they reject the possibility of miracles. They, they teach the impossibility of someone or something breaking into what are the fixed laws of nature. And they say that miracles are an absolute impossibility. It is no, no, no wonder that our country, that our great country is moving further and further away from God. And becoming more and more skeptical about the things of God. That, those are the arguments of the atheist when they doubt the existence of God. But I, I have a question. There is a question that needs to be answered. If in fact there are fixed inalterable laws that are orderly. If in fact there are laws in the world that are, that are working in conjunction one with the other. If in fact every cubic inch in, in the universe is filled with these laws then the question that we have to ask is this. Who created those laws? Who set them in place? Who established them from the very beginning? Somebody give them praise right now. I want to tell you that there is a God in heaven. I want to tell you that there is a God that has power and grace. I want to tell you that there is a law giver and a law maker. Somebody give them praise right now. We believe in miracles because we believe in a mighty God in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, yesterday, our preacher said, and I, I thank God for the word. He said that our president said we can't, we can't, we can't argue, uh, we can't just use words of philosophies and uh, words that are, that are of higher education can't use that to defend all by itself the gospel. You can't take the philosophies of the world and then create Christian philosophies and think that that's going to be enough to convince a world that there is a God. There will always be questions that are asked. So how are we going to answer the problem of what is going on in our colleges and in our universities and in our schools 
How are we going to answer the problem of many of our young people getting indoctrinated and filled with this? Here's how we must answer. The pastors of the apostolic assembly must begin to cry out for the working of miracles in our apostolic churches. Hey, listen. You get an argument that there are no miracles and then you have that young person come on Sunday and see God work the miraculous and it doesn't matter what they say. The word of God will stand because of the power and the demonstration of God in the church and in our ministries. We believe that there is a God. Now, is there an argument? You better believe it, my brother. Is there an argument that goes against the argument of secularism that there is no God? Sure there is. Here's our argument. We believe that there is a God. Is there anybody here that believes that there really is a God? We believe that there is a God. And here's what we believe. We believe that our God is a lawgiver. The laws of nature, he spoke them into existence. Oh, come on, somebody give God praise right now. If, you, if the scientists are looking at a world filled with order, it's because we serve a God of order. And the Bible said that it created everything with the power of his word. We serve a God of order. Now, who set these laws in place the laws of nature that are intertwined and are working in perfect harmony the laws that have each one of them specific duties the laws that create and guide matter and energy in all of the universe you know who set all that in motion our God the Bible says let everything be done decently and in order why is that because our great God in heaven is a God of order and a God of decency and when you look at the world you're gonna find his fingerprints in and absolutely everything that he's spoken to existence. We believe in the power of God. I want you to think about this. Our God is a lawgiver. He establishes order. I want you to think about the chaos that there would be in the world if we lived in a world, world not governed by laws. Not governed by gravitational laws. Not governed by the ideal laws of gas laws or by the law of inertia. Or by the laws of optics or the law of bio All of those laws that are universal in the world. Think about what kind of a disordered world we would have if our God had not established these laws that cannot easily be broken. In fact, they're so well established in the world that... Nature testifies that they cannot be broken. We believe that there is a God. And we believe that our God is a lawgiver. Somebody give him praise. <laughs> Say, Pastor, we believe in God and we believe that our God is a lawgiver. That's right. Now, here's why we believe in miracles. We believe in miracles because if our God created the laws, here's what it means. He's greater than the laws. And if he's greater than the laws, then at any moment that he wants, he can step in and set them aside and do whatever it is that he wills in your life and in my life and wherever it is that he chooses to work. God is wanting to break into the lives of some of you right now. He is wanting to set aside the law of, 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 of entropy. He is wanting to break into your life and heal your body. He is wanting to break into your life and take away that depression and that anxiety and that worry. I want to tell you we serve a God of miracles. We serve a God of power and of grace. Psalms 33, 8 through 12 says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of the heart of all generations. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. I want to tell you 
that we're a blessed people right now. When I get sick in my body, I want to tell you that I'm a blessed man right now. When the doctor gives me a death sentence, I want to tell you that I'm a blessed man right now. When I don't got no money in the bank, I want to tell you I'm a blessed man right now. Because I know the God that is up in heaven. And he's got control of everything in the universe. And every resource that I will ever need. I'm in need. I'm in need. Let's stand, everyone. Just go ahead and stand. If you don't stand, I won't stop. <laughs> these signs, everyone say these signs. Shall follow, shall accompany those that believe in my name. Anybody here believe in that name? That glorious name. Hey, when we pray for the sick, we're not wishing. We're not hoping. Don't worry, Pastor, about praying for the sick. If he doesn't get healed, it's not your problem. It's his problem. He's going to have to work that out. Come on, somebody say amen. You just do your duty. You just do your job. You just do what God's calling you to do right now. And the miraculous is going to begin to work in your ministry. And God is going to raise up a testimony in this generation. That although the Baptists, and I'm not going to name them all, are denying the secessionist, the move of the Holy Ghost, there is a church that believes in the movement of the power of God. There is a church that believes in the miraculous. Jesus is our wonder worker. Quit stressing. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and you tell him, quit stressing. Jesus is your wonder worker. <laughs> May I tell you just through a couple of quick scriptures here. Jesus constantly taught us the true miraculous working of God. In John chapter 2 verse 9, the Bible says, that Jesus superseded the laws of chemistry when he turned water into wine. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. And the servant of the feast called unto the bridegroom. Anybody have a tasteless relationship tonight that needs healing? Anybody running low on provision and on joy? I want to tell you that our God is a wonderful miracle working God. In Mark chapter 6 verse 48, the Bible says that God superseded the law of gravity by walking on water. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them. Is anybody here drowning today? Maybe you're drowning in debt, or maybe you're on a doomed ship today, my hand, my friend. You're headed straight for a shipwreck. I want to tell you that I serve a God that supersedes every law of gravity because he created all the laws that govern the universe. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 16, Jesus superseded the natural healing process by healing people instantly when... The evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Anybody sick in their body this, uh, this evening? Anybody troubled in their spirit? Anybody come in here dragging a devil spirit of whatever that devil spirit might be that you haven't been able to break free from? I want to tell you that in an instant, this is not a healing. This is a miraculous working of God. In a moment. In Matthew 17, 27, Jesus superseded the law of statistical probability by pulling a coin out of a fish's mouth. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast the hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, take it and give it to them for me and for thee. Somebody say amen. Anybody here needing a financial miracle? And whatever your problem might be, I want to tell you that Jesus is a God that controls the laws. Somebody give him praise right now. 
Is there anybody here that has the that, that has that has the the, uh, the odds stacked against you? Everything says you're going to be defeated. Everything says every probability is that there is absolutely no escape from this. I come to tell you that we serve a God that supersedes the laws of uh, of, of probability. It doesn't matter what the doctor has said. It doesn't matter what your therapist has said. It doesn't matter what your financial accountant might said. I want to tell you the only thing that matters is what the God that is in glory will say. If you'll cry out to him, if you'll believe for a miracle, if you'll trust him for something greater than what you have right now, somebody give him praise. In John chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, Jesus superseded the law of entropy or the law of death by raising the dead. You guys all know the story. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Is there anybody dead here? Anybody have a dead sentence on you by a doctor, a lawyer, or somebody else? Anybody here bound hand and foot you can't get free by some sort of addiction or problem that you've got in your life? Anyone here need, anyone need a word from the Lord that says, lose him and set him free? <laughs> lose him from that pain. Lose him from that bondage. Loose him from that problem. Why? Because we believe that there is a God in heaven that's got a scepter in his hand and has a word of authority and power that he, when he speaks, the laws of nature must succumb and must submit to him. We serve a mighty God. I want to know if there's anybody here that needs a miracle. Would you run to this altar just real quick? Can I have two minutes? Come on and run up to this altar real quick. You need a miracle. Maybe you need the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is a miracle. Maybe you've never spoken in other tongues. I know there's a lot of preachers here, but there's got to be some souls. Would you come to this place and we're going to pray right now. And God's going to give you your miracle in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus We don't believe in preachers. We believe in the name of Jesus. We don't believe in the power of man. We believe in the power of God. I want you to speak your problem right now. I want you to put your hand on that area of pain. I want you to put your hand in that area where you're feeling that, 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 that irritation or that, or whatever, that area, that, 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 that stomach, that liver, that back, that's sick right now. I want you right now just to put your hand there and say, in the name of Jesus. Come on, say it. In the name, Pastor, brother, would you come? Say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is here right now. Receive your miracle right now. Every cancer cell. Shatayamaka, I command life into your body right now. In the name of Jesus, tumors will disappear right now. Blind eyes will be open right now. Deaf ears will be restored right now. Shatayamaka, in the name of Jesus. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. Ulcers are being healed right now. God is healing somebody right now from ulcers. Receive your miracle right now. Shatayamaka, deaf ears are being opened right now. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. It's yours. Shatayamaka. Arthritis is being healed right now. Begin to move your hands right now. Begin to move your feet right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
Receive it, receive it, receive it. God is healing right now. God is healing pancreate, pancreatic cancer. In the name of Jesus, a new pancreas is being formed right now. Receive your miracle in the name of Jesus. Chains of addiction are being broken right now. In the name of Jesus, receive deliverance. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, you are free. You are free. You are free. Every chain is broken. You are free. Receive the Holy Ghost. That's it, that's it, that's it. Receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, every chain is broken. Receive it, receive it. You got it, you got it, you got it. Shatayaba, yaba, tayaba.
ha chiesto un milagro levante la mano pastor abrala, cierrala he could not do that before he could not do that before praise God if you receive a miracle a healing in your body today I just want you to lift it lift up your hand if you receive a miracle a healing today in your body would you lift up your hand would you lift up your hand to give a testimony God bless you God bless you praise God a miracle working God thank the Lord for his miracle working power I'm going to ask us all to pray for one particular person here but before that we have a video I want you to see of miracles happen in Asia who the country that the constant brother Woodward preached about yesterday because we serve a God who who is going to reach Asia, and we are going to be part of that. We have, we have a missionary here from Asia that we brought. So watch this video, then we're going we're gonna to pray. ¿Quién irá abriendo caminos, forjando mejores destinos, pautas de amor para la humanidad? ¿Quién dirá? Asumo ese rey, me entrego completo y me uno a la causa de Dios que cambia el corazón. Que mira a esos hombres tan desesperados, que mira a esos matrimonios acabados, o ese niño que está. Solo sin hogar, esperando que alguien te ame. It doesn't matter who you are. God wants to save you. God wants to write your name. Me aquí, Señor, rindo mis derechos. Hoy vengo dispuesto a trazar pautas de amor para la humanidad. Hoy aquí, hoy aquí, asumo ese reto, asumo ese reto y me entrego completo y me uno a la causa de Dios que cambia el corazón.
Praise God. You may be seated. It is truly amazing what God is doing at this conference. And uh, I want to introduce to you our missionary to Thailand, Brother Jerry Fernandez. I had the blessing uh, to ordain him to the ministry my last year as Bishop of the Washington District in 2007. And the Lord has had his hand over him. He's been in Thailand for the last two years. And just in two years, he's baptized five Trinitarian pastors and their congregations. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord, everybody. How many having a great time in the presence of God? Amen. I, I wasn't supposed to be here. I got called a week ago. And he said, you want to come? Pastor Lopez is inviting you. And I was like, sure, I'll go. So I packed my bags. I'm here and I'm having the time of my life. Um, I'm going to go back to Asia. And we're going to continue to baptize people in that powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you soon. Praise God. End Time Restoration has been a missionary conference for the last 27 years. When my family and I were serving as missionaries in South America, Sister Oma Rodriguez, Brother Valdemar Rodriguez's wife, she would, every year she would send us the cassette tapes from End Time Restoration, and we would just hear them over and over and over again. Praise God. This year the Lord has burden Pastor Lopez uh, to just take it a step further. And uh, the Lord has put in his heart that um, from this offering today, there's some checks that need to be paid out to pay for the conference, but anything after that, it's going to our international missions department. And uh, that puts a big smile on my boss. Bishop Provencio, praise God. Amen. I want you to hear this. In December of 2017, I was invited to India. And uh, I was told that uh, this organization that I would be preaching at, they were apostolic. So I simply took it for granted that they were oneness apostolic uh, believers and uh, we formed a team of uh, pastors that went with me to India. And uh, when I got to the conference, there was uh, 87 pastors uh, at this conference. And uh, just like right now, I went behind the pulpit ready to preach. And the Holy Ghost literally, I mean, very strongly got me. And the Lord told me, preach to them my name. Preach to them my name. At that moment, I really didn't understand why. I was still thinking that they were oneness. So I turned back and I told the pastors that were with me, I told them the Lord has shifted direction and uh, we're just going to preach the name of Jesus. So Bishop Zion, who was the bishop of this organization, he was my translator. And uh, what I began to do, I simply took Matthew 28, 19 and just began to dissect uh, that scripture, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, in the middle of the teaching that I was giving, Bishop Zion was translating, and he stops me. And I thought, oh, my God, what, you know, what did I do wrong? He stops me, and he says, Bishop Prado, he said, the Lord has sent you to give us revelation." He said, we've been doing this wrong. He said, now I understand that water baptism is in the name of Jesus. Praise God. We baptized him the day after. And uh, I speak to him quite frequently. I, we've been ministering uh, in India since 2017. And I say this in the presence of the Lord. My wife is right here. I spoke to him early this morning. And I says, Bishop Zion, tell me exactly, tell me exactly how many pastors, tell me exactly how many pastors right now are under your covering that want to come into the covering of the apostolic assembly. Sister Patty, 
How many did he say? Over 600. That is amazing. And Bishop Provencio, uh, Pastor Steve uh, Rodriguez, are you here, Pastor Steve? Would you stand? That's a, that's a future missionary right there. Amen. We're going next month in April, and our bishop uh, from Foreign Missions will be speaking to the pastors, and uh, God is doing something incredible, incredible. The message today that Brother Woodward preached on, 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 on Asia, I mean, I was weeping. I was weeping. Listen, listen, God used Bishop Salazar just to open the door to the miraculous. God used Bishop Salazar to open the door to the miraculous. And God is not finished. Because we're about to see a financial breakthrough. Listen to me. We're about to make history. We're going to pick up the greatest missionary offering today at End Time Restoration. Would somebody say amen to that? Praise God. Bishop Salazar, I... I I had been praying for the gift of the working of miracles for over 20 years. And I had been praying for that gift. Uh, I operate in the gift of faith. But I, I couldn't understand how the working of miracles operates. El hacer milagros. And I was in prayer one day and the, the Lord spoke to me very clearly. And he just simply said, the working of miracles. And he said, you need to work the miracle. You need to work the miracle. What does that mean? Listen, if we don't take action, it's not going to happen. <laughs> That's how the gift of, the, of working of miracles operates. We have to work it. What does that mean? We need to take action. We need to take action. And if we take action today, I promise you, Pastor, God is going to give you a financial breakthrough. I showed Pastor Oseguera, I think it was this morning, I showed him a check. It was last week, I believe. I was at, my wife and I, we had a meeting with a very prominent family. If I was to mention their name, I, I know you know them. And the wife, uh, she came to the church. And she just wanted to see what, what this EPA Apostolic Church is all about. And I gave her a tour. And then she says, uh, I want to go back into the church because I feel something inside your church. I had a our office set up to, you know, with candy, water, coffee, whatever, just to have a good meeting, make her feel comfortable. She goes, no, she goes, I want to go inside the church because I feel good inside there. So we sat and we're talking, and then she asked for a pen. So I had somebody give her a pen, and she opened up her purse, and she began to take what I thought she's taking notes. And then she gave back the pen and she and she got I put it in my pocket I, I thanked her for her generosity I'm thinking a thousand dollars maybe so I walked her to her car I went home and then I remembered the check and I reached into my pocket and I opened up the check and I yelled Patty come here I told her how much is this she says, it's $10,000. You see, that's what God's going to do for you. Would you lift up your hands, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God. I praise you, God. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you are about to do. Lord, I pray blessings right now over every pastor every pastoral family, 
every congregation right now, our brothers who are watching through the internet, I pray that the windows of heaven be opened upon every businessman, every businesswoman, every apostolic family that is here right now, our brothers and sisters who are with us right now on the internet, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, the working of miracles, you need to take a step of faith. And if we take a step of faith today, God is going to do the impossible. Praise God. I want to ask, I want to challenge every pastor that's here. Every pastor, you're all my friends. Praise God. So I'm very confident with you. Amen. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith and make a check for $1,500. $1,500. Listen, you know, we're used to $500. we are used to $1,000. But we're just going to pick it up a little bit. And we're going to do $1,500. Praise God. We're taking a step of faith. Praise God. Who's going to join me right now? In Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that are watching on the internet, amen, you're able also to give electronically. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Bassan to come up right now. He's going to give the instructions on how you're able to give electronically. Amen. You can bring your card right now. You can swipe your card in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we talk about miracles and we talk about the miraculous. God has opened up the door right now for the miraculous in Jesus' name. But we need to take a step of faith. We need to work the miracle in Jesus' name. Who's going to be, the, who's gonna be the, 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 the first pastor that's going to come with me, that's going to that's gonna join me and, and, and give $1,500 in Jesus' name? Praise God. If you're a business person, Praise God. If you have a business, amen. Praise God. You come in Jesus' name and you sow that seed and God is going to bless you. Praise God. God bless you, Pastor. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Oxnard. No, um, Ventura. Ventura. God bless you. I'm Ventura, California. God bless Bishop uh, uh, Joe Aguilar, Merced Apostolic Church. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you, sir. $1,500 on your card. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. Who's going to be the next pastor that's going to take the step of faith? Amen. Estoy invitando a los pastores. Tomemos un paso de fe. Dios va a derramar bendiciones sobre su, sobre su ministerio, sobre su congregación en el nombre de Jesús. Invito a un pastor que se una conmigo para dar $1,500 dólares en el nombre de Jesús. God bless Bishop Provencio, my boss. Thank you, sir. God bless the Provencio family. Amen. Bishop Salazar, praise God, $1,500. Hosanna Apostolic Church, praise God. Amen. You're able to give online. Just simply go to uh, the uh, website. And uh, just follow the instructions there on the website and you're able to give electronically. My brothers and sisters who are wherever you are at home, amen, you're able to give electronically. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Is there another pastor? Is there another pastor, a business uh, uh, person? Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Alguien más que puede unirse. Estamos tomando un paso de fe. We're taking a step of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You're close to your miracle. You just need to take a step of faith. God bless you, Bishop. 1,500. Amen. God bless you, Bishop. Praise God. Yes, sir. Amen. Praise God. Someone else, fifth miracle, to give you the blessing. Praise God. Amen. Someone else right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Tome el paso de fe. Take the step of faith in Jesus' name. Praise God. Jesus, we give to you all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. I want to challenge every pastor. If, you, if, if you're not able to give 1,500, but you're able to give 1,000, amen. I'm going to ask you to come right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we're giving to missions. There's some expenses for end time that will be paid, and after that, uh, whatever the balance is, it's going directly to missions. Praise God. That's why we're going high because we need to give. Praise God. Amen. We want to see revival in Asia. Praise God. Listen, uh, Bishop uh, uh, Provencio and myself and uh, Pastor Rodriguez, we're going to, to Asia. We're going to India next next month. 
And, and, and uh, this money, this money is going to help us bring these pastors, amen, so we can uh, be able to, 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 to talk to them and, and, and empower them, teach them apostolic doctrine, praise God. So we need your help, amen. We need your help in Jesus' name. Is there someone else that can give $1,000? Is there someone else that can give $1,000? Would you come? Praise God. Would you come? God bless you, my brother. God bless you, $1,000. God bless you, sir. Amen. Out in the balcony, praise God. Amen. We have, uh, we have staff there. God bless you. Praise God. If, if, if somebody's giving up there, just wave your hand so I can see. Praise God. Praise God. Is there someone else that can give $1,000 in Jesus' name? Praise God. I want to challenge the young people. We've got a lot of professionals here in the house. God has blessed you. You're blessed economically, and, and uh, amen. You're sowing seeds in Jesus' name. Praise God. Una familia que pueda contribuir, pueda sembrar una semilla de mil dólares en el nombre de Jesús, in Jesus' name. Praise God. You're working the miracle in Jesus' name. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, young man. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Is there another pastor coming with a with thousand dollars? Amen. God bless our district secretary. Pastor uh, Jesse Valdez, a thousand dollars. Praise God. Amen. You can go back home to uh, Sunday, pick up the offering. Amen. And and, and, and you just make that deposit and you'll have the money in the bank. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Take a step of faith. Work your miracle. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Do we have someone else that can give $1,000? In Jesus' name. Alguien más que pueda dar mil dólares. En el nombre de Jesús. Amen. El hacer milagros. Amen. Uh, esto demanda acción. Demands action, praise God. Amen. Mano Vélez, a ver la mano. ¿Cómo está? Look at that. He couldn't do that before. His ligaments, praise God. The Lord healed him. <laughs> you have to work the miracle, praise God. Amen. Alguien más, someone else with a thousand dollars. Amen. Sow the seed. In Jesus' name, take a step of faith. And I promise you, you're going to see God operate. God is going to do the miraculous in your life. In Jesus' name. Someone else. Amen. Take a step of faith in Jesus' name. Praise God. Somebody can come up with $700. In Jesus' name. Alguien que pueda venir con $700. Le invito que venga. Amen. Take that step of faith. Out in the balcony, $700 in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Bishop Amador, God bless you, sir. $1,000, Bishop Amador. God bless you, sir. Amen. First Apostolic Church of Modesto. $1,000, praise God. Amen. Someone else with $1,700? Alguien más que pueda venir con $700? $700? Young person, young couple. Praise God. Businessman, businesswoman. You will see the miraculous, praise God. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask every pastor. You were not able to give $1,500. You were not able to give $1,000. But you're going to take a step of faith and you're going to give $500. Pastor, would you come right now in Jesus' name? Praise God. Businessman, businesswoman, my brother, my sister, come. Take a step of faith and come with $500 in Jesus' name. Would you come? Would you come in Jesus' name? Would you come? Would you come in Jesus' name? $500.
Tome el paso de fe. Tome el paso de fe. God bless you, my sister. Amen. Up on the balcony. Up on the balcony, praise God. Up on the balcony. $500. Praise God. Amen. Someone else that's going to come. $500. God bless Pastor Rodriguez. $500. Uh, Pastor Benavides. Amen. $500. In Jesus' name. All the way from Texas. Come on, California. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. EPA Apostolic Church, $500. God bless you, my sister. Praise God. Amen. Someone else, $500. Come on, Pastor, work your miracle. Work your miracle in Jesus' name. Work your miracle, my brother, my sister, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Out in the balcony, work your miracle. Praise God. Take a step of faith, $500. Tome el paso de fe. Praise God. Praise God. Alguien más? Someone else with $500. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to come with $300 right now in Jesus' name. Would you come with $300 right now in Jesus' name? Would you come with $300? Venga con $300 in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, would you lift up your hands with me, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would touch every heart right now. Move our generosity in the name of Jesus. Help us to give, God. Help us to believe, Lord. Help us to take a step of faith, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on up here with $300, would you? In Jesus' name. Up on the balcony. Up on the balcony, praise God. Amen. You can come with $300, come. Amen. You can come with $200, would you come right now? God bless you, young man. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. Would you come with $200? Venga con 200 dólares, puede usar su tarjeta, su tarjeta de débito, you can use your debit card. God bless you, my brother, 200 dollars, God bless you, God bless you, sister, 200 dollars, God bless you. Where are you from? Morgan Hill, praise God, God bless you, sister, amen, 200, God bless you, amen, she brought cash, praise God, amen. Alguien más con 200 dólares. Someone else with 200 dollars. Would you come? In Jesus' name. God bless you, sir. God bless you. 200 dollars. God bless you. God bless you, sister. Praise God. Someone else with 200 dollars. Would you come? Up on the balcony. God bless you, my sister. God bless you. Up on the balcony. God bless you. 200 dollars. Amen. We have a staff up there. You can use your card. How much? 200. God bless you, sir. Amen. God bless you, 200. Amen. Would you come? Would you come with those $200 in Jesus' name? Praise God. Alguien más con 200 dólares. Le invito que venga. Le invito que pase en el nombre de Jesús. Praise God. Praise God. Would you lift up your hands with me, Jesus? 
We give you all the honor, God. We give you all the glory, God. We give to you all the praise, God. Would you move in our hearts? Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to come and bring $100. Would you come right now in Jesus' name? Praise God. Amen. Come with the $100. In Jesus' name. God bless you, Bishop. Amen. $100. All the way from the East Coast. God bless you. $100. Praise God. Praise God. Would you come? God bless you. $100. Would you come? Up on the balcony, $100. Praise God. God bless you, my brother. Bringing cash. Praise God. God bless you, young man. Venga con 100 dólares en el nombre de Jesús. Venga con 100 dólares. You can come with a hundred dollars. In Jesus' name. Up on the balcony, praise God. Amen. You need to work your miracle. You need to work your miracle, praise God. God bless Bishop Moran, our supervisor in uh, Africa. Praise God. Alguien más con 100 dólares pase. Would you come? Praise God. Would you come? Praise God. If you can come with $50, I'm going to ask you to come. Venga con 50 dólares en el nombre de Jesús. Amen. Come with $50 up on the balcony. Take a step of faith in Jesus' name. Dios le bendiga, mi hermana. God bless you, my sister. Praise God. Come with $50. God bless you. I'll take it. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, sister. Praise God. Amen. Come with $50 in Jesus' name. Praise God. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Praise God. I'm going to ask everyone that can come with $20, would you come right now in Jesus' name? Praise God. If you can come with $20 in Jesus' name, the ushers right now are also passing out the offering. Uh, a tracer you can give. Praise God in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you, sir. Praise God. Amen. Whatever God puts in your heart to give, would you come right now in Jesus' name? God bless you, my sister. $1,000, praise God. Remodeling Incorporated, all the way from San Jose, $1,000, praise God. Somebody magnify the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. Amen. And somebody praise the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Pastor Lopez with us. Praise God. Be praised. 
You are Alpha Ooh. and Omega. Come on, with our hands lifted, we worship You. We worship You, O oh Lord, for. It's you, Lord. It's you, Lord. It's always been you. 
is he worthy? Is he worthy? Hallelujah. What is his name? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor Woodward, all the way from Canada, just came from the Philippines, made a huge effort to be here, as I keep saying. Pastor Woodward with us to deliver the word of God to End Time Restoration 2019. Praise the Lord, everybody. That little song they were just singing comes from a very special area of the world. You know, God's people are so wonderful wherever you find them. And that name of Jesus is so powerful and beautiful. You have brothers and sisters that live in conditions you wouldn't want to spend the night, let alone your whole lifetime. goodness. <laughs> One of our national leaders in Africa, in his country, every member of his family was slaughtered by rebel forces in his country, all killed brutally. And then those rebels took over the country and became the government. And he tries to lead a church in that country. And when I talked to him, his smile would light up this room. He's had so much that he could be bitter about. So much that he could just be mad at God forever about. But when he says the name of Jesus, his smile is a thousand watts. And that little song, I, I want him to come out and get ready. That little song they were singing, it comes from the middle of one of those war-torn nations in Africa where people have literally nothing and that's where they wrote that little song. We give you all the glory. Now, isn't this conference awesome, magnificent? Pastor Adam and this church, what a great job. And all this technology, and we've got such talented people. Even my brother's back there in that sound room, so they can do anything back there. And we just gave a great missions offering. Thank you for that. And we've got a great missionary with us in this conference. Thank you for having a missionary here. That's important. So they're going to do a mixing job. We'll see how good they do. Because this afternoon we played that magnificent moment from the Philippines of 42,000 people worshiping God, 8,000 people getting the Holy Ghost. We're going to put that on the screen, and they can just mix the sound of many waters with this team singing. We give you all the glory, and I'd like you to join some brand new brothers and sisters, 8,000 strong from Manila this past Sunday afternoon, and ring the rafters with praise. We ready to go? Let's start. Sing. Mix we it in together. give you
us a praise in this building. privilege it is to be here. Thank you to Pastor Adam, my friend, and all that have allowed me to be here. It's good to be with so many friends in this audience, and I'm grateful for all of you, precious saints of God, and wonderful, courageous, anointed ministers of the gospel. What a privilege it is to share this conference with you. We're going to go to a bunch of scripture in the next few moments, so I won't ask you to remain standing while I take a text, but I would ask you to remain standing long enough to put your hands and your heart and your voice and your spirit in the air one more time and tell God He has permission to speak to you. Would you do that all over this building? Lift up your voice. Give God permission to speak to you. He's been talking already in this service. He's been moving already in this service. I thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. You may be seated. I want to take you to a very particular passage of Scripture written by one of the gospel writers, and he's the only one that tells this story in this detail. He's the historian of the first century church. And in his gospel, in chapter 24, Luke writes these words in verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And as they talked, and they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near. And went with them. But somehow, through a miracle of God, or because they didn't live in the day of social media where they knew what everybody looked like all around the world, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Apparently, Jesus didn't have a Facebook page. It's the third day after the crucifixion of Jesus. The disciples are demoralized. Most of them are in hiding. Their hopes and their dreams have been viciously nailed to a cruel cross and buried forever in a dark tomb. You can criticize them if you want to. You can berate them for their lack of faith if you choose to do so. But for them, they were there. And for them, it all died when they saw Jesus die. It all ended for them as the stone was rolled over the mouth of that grave that literally mocked their faith. For them, there's nothing left to live for. Everything they ever believed in or hoped in is gone. And so two of the disciples decide, you know what, we've done our little bit for king and country We've hung around here for a couple of days, but it's over. And so there's no sense in lingering in Jerusalem anymore. And so they get up and they leave on that third day and they head home to their little village of Emmaus, about eight miles northwest of Jerusalem. And as they walk, these two disciples talk. And as they talk, 
they get more and more and more discouraged. Nothing is right in their world. All is lost. No reason to smile. Definitely no reason to believe anymore. And then a stranger joins them on this winding road to their little village. Now, you and I know who he is from hindsight, but on this day, they have no such luxury. They have no sweet clue who he is. His identity is totally, completely, perhaps supernaturally hidden from them. And so when he walks up to them and begins to walk with them, and then he asks that question, why are you sad? They do what you would have done. They dump three days of despair on him. Verse 17, he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, he's apparently the spokesman, his name is Cleopas, he answered and said to this stranger, Are you just a stranger here in Jerusalem? You literally really don't know the things that have come to pass there in these days. And with a touch of heavenly irony and celestial humor, the stranger looks at him and says, What things? As if he wouldn't know. And then they dump on him. You haven't heard? It's concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Chief priest, we can't. To an unfair system. And he was condemned to death and now they've crucified him and our life is over. Are you serious? You must be the only person in Jerusalem that's so oblivious that you haven't heard what's happened in the last three days. How in the world did you miss that? Cleopas and his companion are totally unaware of who they're talking to. And so in a jumble of words, they just pour out days of fear and doubt and heartbreak. Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet like nobody else. His words rang with an authority that we had never, ever heard before. And he did so many mighty miracles among the people. He touched lives. He healed cripples. We know some of them. He opened blinded eyes. He even healed lepers and restored them to their families. And because of all of that, we pinned every one of our hopes on him. He gave us reason to live. But it is over, Mr. Stranger. He's gone. He's dead. He was condemned by our own Jewish Sanhedrin. He was crucified by the Roman government. It's over. It's done. We can hardly believe it, but our leaders, our own people, handed this good man over to be killed. They delivered him. The word in the Greek language there, they delivered him. They handed him over. The, the word in the Greek language is paradidomi. It means handed over. We translate it that way in English, but... We also translate it to deliver. It's a judicial word. It comes from the court system of the day. And it means to deliver something or someone into the hands of another. To hand someone over to be kept in custody. To deliver a person to be judged or condemned or punished or put to death. But in scripture, that word paradidomy, it most often is accompanied by a sense of betrayal. It's not just handing someone over. It's handing someone over deceitfully. It's handing someone over treacherously. And because of what happened to Jesus, you would expect the gospel writers to use that word quite often, and they do. More than 70 times between the four of them. And Jesus himself uses that word many times when he talks about Judas, the one who set in motion by his betrayal all of the events that have happened over the last three days that handed Jesus over to the Roman government and delivered him up to the cross. It's everywhere in the Gospels. Mark 14, 10, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, he went unto the chief priest to betray him, to hand him over, to deliver him up. When they heard it, they were glad. They promised to give Judas money. And then forever after that moment, he sought how he might conveniently betray Jesus, hand him over, deliver him up. There's that word again. Mark 14, 18. As they sat and did eat, Jesus looked at his disciples eyeball to eyeball. And he said, verily I say unto you, one of you that's eating with me right now, you're going to hand me over. You're going to betray me. You're going to deliver me up treacherously. John 18, and Judas also, which betrayed him. There's the word again. He handed him over. He betrayed him. He, he treated him deceitfully and treacherously. Judas knew the place where Jesus was going to pray. 
Because Jesus often resorted thither with his disciples. Luke 22, maybe the most memorable line from that account. Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? You're handing me over to my enemies with a kiss? You're betraying me? You're treacherously turning me over and delivering me up? You see, for many months, Jesus knew this was coming. And he warned his disciples over and over about his betrayal. He actually used this word. He said, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to be crucified. He clearly told them to expect it. But just as clearly, he told them that his death would not be the end. But you know how we are. We're quick to grasp bad news and we're slow to believe good news. Matthew 20. Jesus said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be betrayed. There's the word again. The Son of Man is going to be treacherously handed over, delivered up to the chief priests and the scribes. They'll condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him. There's the word again. They're going to hand him over, deceitfully use him, treacherously deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify. And the third day he shall rise again. But nobody got that. They didn't get any of it. Now finally that the crucifixion has unfolded, they understand that Jesus was speaking prophetically about his death, but they've all forgotten the last line of what Jesus said, that death isn't the end. Now these two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, they think they've got a little bit of extra information that obviously this stranger doesn't have. Unlike the stranger, we've been in Jerusalem the last three days. Unlike you, Mr. Stranger, we saw Jesus handed over like a sack of potatoes from one judge to another. It was a cruel mockery of justice. It had political maneuvering and sham trials and false witnesses and hateful jurors and a predetermined sentence of death. It was awful. It was the worst travesty of justice we'd ever seen. Mark 15, straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and carried him away. There's that word again. They delivered him up. They handed him over. They passed him over to Pilate. Mark 15, 15, so Pilate, willing to content the people, he released a known criminal, a known murderer, a known insurrectionist. He released Barabbas unto them, and there's that word again. And he delivered Jesus. He handed him over. He used him treacherously and deceitfully. He delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So here's how it went. It looks like the worst defeat, the worst travesty, the worst mockery of justice in the history of the planet. Judas handed him over to the chief priests. And the chief priests handed him over to the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin handed him over to Pilate. Pilate handed him over to Herod. Herod said, I can't do anything with him. He handed him over back to Pilate. And finally, Pilate hands him over to an angry mob to be crucified. And that's why the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, when we saw Jesus handed over, it was like somebody reached in our heart, got a hold of our hope, and handed over every bit of our hope to. There's no hope now. There's no life now. There's no reason now. We have given up. You can criticize us if you want. You can look down on us if you like. But we have given up and we are headed home. And we're going to scrape together the little remainders of our life. And we're going to do what we can to have a little bit of happiness before we die. But let me tell you, our, our hope was handed over. There is nothing left. You, you can hear the pain in their voice. Verse 21, we trusted it would have been him that should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day. It's not like we cut and ran. And by the way, Mr. Stranger, this morning, certain women also of our company, they made us astonished because they went early to the sepulcher and they found no body and they came back and said they'd seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And then certain of us, they went to the sepulcher and they found it just as the women had said, but him they saw not. So you know what we we reach the obvious logical conclusion. The women are delusional. And men have forever reached that conclusion. Bunch of crazy women, you know, they're emotional. They'll believe anything. 
And they even convinced some of the guys that went. But here's the thing. He wasn't there. And if he's not there, he's gone and we're done and we're going home. Now you can get up on your high apostolic horse and you can criticize these people all day long if you want. But nothing hits us harder than when we lose our hope. It knocks the breath out of us. It saps our strength. It steals our joy. It wounds our heart. It blocks our vision. It rocks our world. And it shakes our faith when our hope is hurt. And that's exactly what happened to those two disciples. Can you imagine? They left Jerusalem, dummy. They left Jerusalem on the third day. You couldn't even wait around till sunset to see if something was going to happen. But on the third day, on resurrection morning, on that day of all of heaven and earth coming together in the greatest triumph that you could ever imagine. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, no, no. Don't clap. They're headed home. They've turned their back on the miracle and they're walking in the wrong direction. They're headed home. They're not sitting around at the tomb going 10, 9, 8. No, they're not even doing that. They have left and they're going home. You would think after the women came back from an empty tomb saying there was no body and there was a message from the angels, you would think they would have believed. But before you judge them too harshly, think back over your life or maybe even your last week and remember a time when your hope has been shaken and your faith has been taken, it's easy to feel alone in times like that. But I have good news for you. Jesus is walking with you right now. It's at that moment that the stranger can restrain himself no longer. He looks at them and he says, oh, you are so thick-headed and so slow-hearted. Couldn't you just have believed everything the prophets have been saying all these years? Don't you understand this? Jesus had to go through these things. He had to be handed over. You don't get it yet, but don't you see his suffering was a pathway to his glory. His death was a pathway to his resurrection. That defeat that you saw, it was was a pathway to the greatest miracle that the world has ever seen. You don't get it yet, but if you could just see, you just don't understand. And then that stranger, they still don't know who he is, points out to them as they walk and they talk. He points out Jesus on every page of the Old Testament. Now, we don't have that sermon. I wish we did. But he starts and he said, don't you remember in the book of Genesis, God breathed into them the breath of life and man became a living soul. D don't you understand? That was Jesus there doing that. D don't you understand? You know, Abraham and Isaac and, 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 and they're walking up the mountain and they're on their way. The old patriarch is going to kill his son of promise. And, and his son looks at him and says, Dad, we got everything. We got fire and we got wood and you've got a knife. And, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And that old patriarch with tears running down his face trying to obey a God that he'd never seen and he's just trusting with almost what you'd call blind faith. He turns around to his little boy and he looks at Isaac and, and the spirit of prophecy hits him on the worst day of his life and he said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And that stranger says, don't you understand? He was pointing to Jesus just like Isaac was supposed to become a sacrifice, but there was a substitution. That's what Jesus did, and he's pointing out Jesus on every page. Don't, don't you understand? You remember Joseph, that favored son of Israel? Don't you remember his story? The first time we see Joseph, he's being betrayed by his brethren. He's being sold for silver. He's being banished to Egypt. And, and we think it's all over for Joseph. But the second time we see him, he's sitting on a throne. <laughs> he's got power. 
Pharaoh gave him a name that was above every other name in Egypt. And the second time we see Joseph, it's not the same Joseph in the pit with the tears and the mud and the brothers over the top selling him for silver. No, the second time we see him, he's got a name higher than every other name. He's on a throne and every knee is bowing to him. Don't you understand? The stranger said, that was a picture of Jesus. You've only seen him the first time, but there's a second time coming. Oh, I wish I could get an apostolic in the 21st century to believe that. We've only seen him on this planet for the first time, but the second time's coming. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I don't have time, but that stranger, he had time. They walked all afternoon. It's an eight-mile journey, and he explains to them. He said, you remember Exodus? That, that Passover lamb and the blood shed and the blood applied. Don't you understand? That was a picture of Jesus. You remember Leviticus, the, the high priest and going in and offering the blood. Don't you understand? Jesus was offering a spotless, sinless sacrifice. And he's explaining this to them all afternoon. Don't you understand? In Numbers, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, that supernatural manifestation that led them through the wilderness, that was a manifestation of the presence and the power of Jesus. Don't you, don't you get it? And he walks them through their whole Old Testament. It's, it's amazing. You know, you remember those three Hebrew boys in the fire and that pagan king? He, he gets his soldiers to throw them in. And then he walks over to the edge of the fire and he goes, Hey, guys, you made a mistake. Did we not throw three men bound into the fire? They say, Yes, sir. Because they know if they didn't do it right, they're next in the fire. And that king said, Wait a minute, I see four in the fire. And they're not bound. In fact, they're walking around loose. Can't you imagine that stranger walking on that dirt road with those two disciples saying, don't you get it? That was Jesus in that fire. He, he goes all afternoon. It's, it's amazing what he does. And uh, that would have been some sermon. Luke chapter 24, verse 28. And they drew near to the village whither they went. And the stranger acted like he was going to keep on traveling. He was going to go further. But they constrained him. They begged him, oh, please come in. They said, abide with us. It's toward evening. The day's far spent. And so the stranger goes in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread. And he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them. I think that's what happened. I can't prove it. But when he opened his hand and he passed them each a piece of bread, they saw gaping wounds that any normal man, he would have bled out in minutes. And this guy's been walking with them all afternoon with those wounds they somehow hadn't noticed before. And the Bible says their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. He vanished and then they vanished. They said one to another, wait a minute, didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't you feel that? Didn't you sense that while he talked with us, by the way, and he opened up to us the scriptures, and just as quick as he vanished, they vanished. They get up the same hour, and they headed back that same eight-mile dirt road, running a little faster all the way to Jerusalem. And by the time they got back there, they found the 11 gathered together, and they that were with them, and now the narrative has changed. And they're saying, hey, the Lord has risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon Peter, and then these two got in the act, and they told all the things that were done in the way and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. You see, they thought all hope was gone. They thought all reason to live was over. And they are actually walking in the wrong direction, away from their miracle. And Jesus is so merciful that even for people that were walking in the wrong direction away from their miracle, he caught up with them, spent all afternoon with them, revealed himself to them, turned them around, and headed them back in the direction of the greatest miracle of human history. That's how merciful your God is. It was when Jesus broke the bread just like he did at the Last Supper, that their eyes were suddenly opened to that revelation of who he was. 
It's an amazing thing. By the time they get back to Jerusalem, they, they know that something supernatural has happened. The Lord has risen indeed. And my friends, only then does it begin to dawn on those two and all the other disciples. Wait, wait a minute. We've spent the last three days staring defeat in the eyes and being defeated by defeat. We've spent the last three days having all the hope and the joy and the life sucked out of us by what we could see. Only at that moment when they all get back together in Jerusalem does it dawn on them. And I don't know who said it first, but somebody said it. Wait a minute. This was God's plan all along. This wasn't a martyrdom. This wasn't a murder victim. This wasn't an unfortunate turn of events. The stranger explained that to us all afternoon. This was God's plan from the opening verses of the book of Genesis until Jesus breathed his last on the cross. It was always God's plan. It didn't look that way. It looked like a defeat. Jesus looked like a victim. Judas handed him over to the chief priests. The chief priests handed him over to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin handed him over to Pilate, and Pilate handed him over to Herod, and Herod handed him back to Pilate, and Pilate handed him over to the Roman soldiers, and they all handed him over to an angry mob, and he was crucified, and it looked like a defeat. But then, on the cross, just before he breathed his last, here's what Jesus said, John 19 and 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. We always go there. We can also go here. And he bowed his head. And paradidomi. He handed over, gave up, delivered up his spirit. It wasn't them delivering Jesus up. Jesus was getting himself in position so he could deliver himself up. They weren't in charge. It just looked like they were in charge. He was in charge the entire time. And the devil fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Jesus' life was not taken from him by the chief priests or the Sanhedrin or Pilate or the Roman soldiers. They only handed him over temporarily. Jesus was in charge the entire time. He was handing his life over as a ransom for the souls of men. Calvary wasn't a defeat. Calvary was the most cunning ambush in the history of the world. Calvary happens to be the only time in human history that I know of that God and Satan agreed. And crucify him, and he's got Pilate rubbing his hands, and he's got chief priests yelling and falsely accusing, and the devil thinks he's doing it, but up in heaven, God's agreeing with him. Do your best, work it out. Manipulate all you want. Get my people in a corner. Get all hope sucked out of them. Make everybody cry. You do your worst. But see, while you're doing your worst, I'm getting ready to do my best because Calvary is not going to be a defeat. Calvary is going to be ground zero of the apostolic church for the rest of human history. You're not handing me over, Satan. I'm handing you over. Oh, my goodness. John 10, 18. It's not like Jesus didn't tell him. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. What are you saying? That's heaven's plan all along. Do you understand that heaven's plan always doesn't look like your plan? 
Do you understand that heaven's plan sometimes takes you through deep, dark valleys where you want to beat your head against a wall and wring your hands and your eyes fill with tears and your face is wet from weeping and your mind is burdened with so many possibilities and so many trials and so many people that are doing stupid things and you because heaven is willing to take the long look. Heaven is willing to take the long plan. Heaven is willing to take the extra mile to make sure that when your victory finally gets here, it's going to knock the devil down. And in the meantime, we have apostolic anxiety and Pentecostal panic attacks. God wasn't surprised by the diagnosis you got last week. Heaven didn't go running around looking in the file room to figure out plan B for when you got that terrible news. God's in charge of your life. Way back in the opening chapters of the Gospel of John, Jesus answered and said, John 2, 19, you destroy this temple? In three days, I will raise it up. What are you saying, Jesus? I'm saying hell you can do your worst, but I can turn any defeat into a victory. I can turn any grave into a resurrection. John 11. There's this wonderful family, three siblings. They're, they're really cool. Um, Jesus loved them. He spent a lot of time at their house. Uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You remember these three? And... Uh, Mary's the workaholic, or Mary's the prayer warrior, and Martha's the workaholic, and they fight all the time. Mary's always in the living room praying, interceding, worshiping God, saying, Martha, would you stop being so carnal and get in here with me and do what I'm doing? And meanwhile, Martha's out in the kitchen, and the more Mary prays, the more Martha clangs pots together to give her a hint that she should be out here washing dishes. And no wonder Lazarus decided to check out early. Just like, see ya. But Jesus raised him from the dead and said, hey, bud, back there. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. Look at your siblings and your relatives and your family. God's got a sense of humor. If you didn't get that joke, you're it. <laughs> Stop. I'm supposed to be preaching. And when Lazarus dies, and it's incredibly sad, and Jesus doesn't even come to the funeral, he shows up four days later. And Martha, this time, she goes out to Jesus. She says, Lord, if you'd just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, you left us alone. On the worst day of our life, you didn't show up. When we were crying, you didn't come. And Jesus looked back at her and he said, Oh, Martha, you don't understand. You think I left you alone? Martha, when you believe in me, you're never alone. Ever, 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 ever alone. And he looks back at her in verse 25 and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Martha, though the worst case scenario has unfolded in your life, I can take that and turn it around for my glory. I'm, I'm almost done. After his crucifixion, Jesus went into the grave. Because you got to understand, in the Old Testament... The realm of death was controlled by the devil because Adam and Eve signed this world over to him lock, stock, and barrel by their sin in the garden. He's still called the prince and power of the air. He still has a lot of authority in this domain. <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Peter records that in one of his epistles. 
That's another sermon I would have loved to have heard preached by the mouth of Jesus himself declaring his victory to those spirits in prison. He declared his victory over sin and the devil and death and hell and the grave. But something happened in that grave on that weekend. The devil is having a major celebration. Hell thinks that they have won and they've stopped the mouth of the Nazarene and they've shut down God's plan to love everybody through this Jesus person. And somehow God himself blinded the eyes of the devil somehow as to who Jesus really was. You catch glimpses in the gospels where the devil and demons kind of recognize him. But then it's like they lapse back into spiritual blindness because if, the, if they had known what God was up to at Calvary. The Bible says, if they had known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That was just asking for trouble. See, when you die, legally the devil has a right to take your carcass into the realm of the dead. That's the deal from the Garden of Eden. And that deal will last until Jesus returns. But not Jesus. See, you're a sinner, born a sinner. And so you've got a redeemed spirit. And God's working on your mind. But your old carcass, that's not redeemed yet. That's why you've got arthritis and bursitis and all those other itises. You think that's the devil? That's not the devil. That's old age. That's what that is. (laughs) One lady said to me, I don't like that hairdo because that hairdo makes me look old. It's like, sister, it's not your hair making you look. It's not your hair. It's not your hair. I have zero idea where that came from. Oh, yeah. So your body, the devil legally has permission to take it into the grave. But not Jesus. He was sinless. He was spotless. And somehow God blinded the eyes and the mind of the devil. And he takes the Lord of glory. Who happens to be residing in a body that he prepared for himself. He pulls him into the realm of the dead. That was a big mistake. Jesus preaches a sermon declaring his victory to all the spirits that are in prison. And then he walks up to the devil, and I just can imagine this. He said, hey, devil, you know those keys that you've used to lock up my people ever since the Garden of Eden? The keys of death and hell and the grave and sickness and bondage and addiction and all that business? Those keys? Hand it over. That was God's plan all along. The devil wasn't handing Jesus over. Jesus was getting himself in position to take the keys to everything the devil ever tried to use to lock you up. Jesus said, hand it over. You don't get to do it anymore. Not for my people. (laughs) Revelation 118. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. The devil held those keys for centuries, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. But when Jesus walked up to the devil in his own domain, he said, Paradidomi, hand it over. Now the Bible says the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. And that's why you're so scared of it. That's why a doctor's diagnosis can send you into a panic. Because to a human being, the worst enemy, the last enemy, the greatest enemy is death. But if Jesus already defeated your worst enemy, your last enemy, your greatest enemy, he already defeated your greatest enemy 2,000 years ago. 
it's all downhill for him after that. It's easy for him after that. If he's already defeated your worst enemy, your last enemy, and your greatest enemy, he can defeat any enemy. He can defeat any circumstance. He can turn around any situation. He can heal any disease. He can release any miracle. He can do whatever he wants because he holds the keys to the domain of heaven and the domain of earth and now the domain of hell. He holds the keys because he won them fair and square at Calvary. If the devil doesn't even have the keys to his own domain anymore, why would you let him bind you and lock you up and discourage you and talk to you? Why would you let him get in your ear and in your face and tell you what he's going to do? He can't even lock up people in his own domain anymore. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the Holy Ghost can spring anybody out of the trap of the tempter. Oh, my I'm done. I just got one more scripture. There's one detail about that story in the Gospel of Luke that nearly every Bible commentator, most preachers, songwriters, poets, even artists that paint beautiful pictures, there's one detail about that encounter that almost all of them miss. And yet it's right there in the scripture, just as plain as day. John 19, verse 25. Now there stood up by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. There it is. That wasn't two men walking home with Jesus. That was a husband and a wife walking home to their little house, discouraged beyond belief. And as they walk, they just keep talking about everything that's wrong. Because sometimes, even for ministry people, our talk on the way home is different than our big talk on the platform, in the pulpit, in the song service, in the middle of the sermon. It wasn't two guys walking home. It was Cleopas and his little wife, Mary. And they are in total depression. And their talk at home doesn't match their talk that they've had for the last three and a half years as they've followed Jesus. It's a husband and wife on that road. And they're headed home talking about defeat. And they're not even realizing that while they're walking home talking about defeat, the greatest victory in human history has unfolded behind them. They're walking in the wrong direction. They're walking away from their miracle. They should know better, but they don't. They should feel better, but they don't. And they're going home in total defeat. And this Jesus that we've worshipped here tonight is so loving and so merciful. That when that little couple is walking home in total defeat, holding on to each other because there's nothing left. They've got nothing more to give. And they have no emotional strength and they've cried every tear. And they've prayed every prayer and they've agonized for days. And nothing's changed. Our Jesus is so merciful. He had a busy weekend that weekend. He had a lot to do. He had to accomplish a lot spiritually. He had to present blood on the heavenly altar. He, he, he had to go preach to the spirits in prison. He had to go take back those keys. He had a lot to do. But he's so merciful, he caught up to them on a road away from their miracle. And he spent a whole afternoon just talking with them and telling them, listen, listen, listen. What your eyes see is not the end of your story. What your ears have heard is not the end of your situation. What they said is not the final verdict on your life. What happened to you, that is not the end 
of your ministry. I wish somebody right now would lift up your hands and give God all you got. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That was good, but that wasn't all you got. Give God a praise in this room. We're good just for a sec, bro. I release my intercessors that are in this room. Those of you that have a gift of intercession, would you not worry what it sounds like or acts like or looks like? I release you intercessors to lead us right now. There's something going to happen for some ministry couples and some church leaders in the next few moments. But we just need to see the clouds right now. I release you to do what you do in the Holy Ghost. You don't have to wait on us. You don't have to wait on us. Elo bo sha sabakota la baha. Mendo la baha ya siato ko ya baha. Ilabo ya sia saboto ko sha. I wish somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost would pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Le bolosha sadalaboko Yamaha. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give you just a moment of instruction and then we're going to let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. I'm talking to a ministry couple, a leadership couple in a church. I'm talking to somebody right now that your talk to everybody else, which is so positive and so uplifting, and you have invested your life and your time and your heart and your guts in trying to help people and lift people and minister to people and preach to people and teach people. And you came to ETR and you are worn out and beat down. And the worst thing of all is in your sheer frustration and your days of depression and your moments of anger, you've said things and done things that didn't reflect God's best character in you. You've preached faith and gone home and talked doubt. You've preached joy and you've gone home and you've talked depression. And the only people that know it in this room are the people that go home with you. And Jesus loves you so much that even though some of the mess is your fault, He loves you so much that while you've been walking in the wrong direction in your little fit of depression and your little bout of anger and, and your little just kind of temper tantrum against God, Jesus loves you so much that he, you didn't even see him. You didn't even know who he was. You didn't even detect him. But he's caught up with you. And right now, tonight, he wants to lay his hand on your shoulder and reveal to you that it's going to be okay. And he's going to do something to turn that mess into a miracle. He's going to turn that depression into a great dynamic victory. That's what he's going to do. That's what he always does.
Our biggest enemy in the next five minutes will not be the devil. Our biggest enemy in the next five minutes will be our ego. Because we all have images to protect, right? And it is a treacherous trap of the enemy to suck the life and the joy out of church leaders. He'll let you prop yourself up on a stage and tell everybody else to have joy as long as he knows that he can beat you down and beat you to a pulp when you get home. He doesn't care what you say here as long as he can hear you talking defeat and depression and anger at home. He doesn't care what you say here. But Jesus has caught up with somebody here in this room tonight. So if you can get past your ego that needs everybody to think you're okay all the time, God has a special blessing for you tonight. We're going to make it easy for you. We're just going to get everybody to move in just a minute. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And I'm going to ask you to let your hands rise into the air. And now the most important part, because the center of spiritual warfare in your life is not your hands. No matter how hard you clap them or how high you raise them, that's not the center of spiritual warfare in your life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So right now, would you let out the hunger for God that you've been feeling all around the edges of this service? Would you let out your desire for God? But most of all, would you just get real with God? Jesus, I need you. Here's what was going to happen on Friday night at ETR. Jesus wants to walk home with somebody tonight. He wants to invade your living room and your kitchen table. He wants to turn around your self-talk of defeat and your couple talk of anger and jealousy and bitterness. And he'll do it if you let him. Oh. Altars are open. If you can get here, I'd love for you to move. But even if you can't, if you just move a few feet out into an aisle and pack the sides. Oh, we got to protect our ego right now. What if somebody thinks, who cares what they think? Jesus has invaded this house so he can walk home with you and invade your house. I'm sorry, bro. We're good for just a second. Let your cry out. Let your hunger out. Something supernatural is fixing to go home with you. Jesus isn't content for you to put on your best image in church and go home depressed, go home defeated, go home angry. He's wanting to walk home with you tonight. All through this audience and across this front, would you help me right now? I need brother to brother, sister to sister, and couple to couple. I need you to turn around and pray with somebody right now. Don't just pray beside them, turn to them and pray for them right now. In the name of Jesus, there's a healing coming to some ministry couple in this service. There's a healing coming to some leadership couple in this moment. All back in the seats if you...
Jesus can break any fetter. Jesus can heal any sickness, but Jesus can also heal your emotions. Yes, be free in the name of Jesus. Be delivered from that attack of the enemy on your mind in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is higher and the blood of Jesus is greater.
The Bible says, the Bible says in the last chapter of the book of Job that God turned the captivity of Job when Job prayed for his friends. Now the devil probably had braced himself for what's happened here tonight. But he's not expecting a second wave. He thinks we're done for Friday night. I'm going to ask you if you would help me all the way up in the balcony. There are some worshipers and intercessors up in the balcony. I've been seeing you, and we've been feeling the effects of your prayer. I'm going to ask you, everybody in this building that will help me right now, I want you to connect with at least one other person. Get in position. Get in position. We're going to pray together. But I need you to connect with at least one other person. A couple with a couple, a brother with a brother, family with family, sisters with sisters. Now we're going to send up one second wave of prayer because there's still somebody's deliverance that's weighing heavy on me right now. Some of you already prayed through it, cried through it, and you got delivered from it. But there's somebody else that it's just not there for you yet. We're going to send up one more wave of prayer and intercession and praise and worship to God because I am telling you the truth. Jesus wants to walk home with somebody. And he wants to sit in your living room and change the talk that's been heard around your table. You ready? We're going to give the worship team a break for about five minutes here. They're so anointed, but we're not going to let them just kind of bleed anointing all over us. We're going to be anointed when we pray right now to the top row of the balcony, from that wall to that wall, from the back to the front. Would you lift your voice right now and pray a delivering prayer over your brother and your sister. In somebody's deliverance is contingent on what you're doing right now. God sees you, sister, back there. God sees you, brother, up there. Yes! Yes, in the name of Jesus! The devil wasn't expecting this one. This is the ambush. Devil, we're not taking this. We are not going home to the same old, same old, to the same old talk and the same old fights and the same old depression. In the name of Jesus, I'm loosed of that. I'm delivered from that. Yes, yes.
Receive the Holy Ghost, whoever you are, in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing right now, paid for by the blood of Jesus. Don't you dare stop. Somebody is too close to their deliverance. Jesus has walked into this room right now. Don't you dare stop that close. Yes, yes. If you're finished praying, start praising because praise will bring victory for somebody else who's still praying. Come on, let's continue to praise him. Somebody's blessing is right here, right now. Somebody's receiving the deliverance. Somebody's receiving it. Come on, somebody, if you want it, you can have it. If you need it, you can have it. It's yours. It's yours. Come on, somebody's got to shout it out this evening. If you want you can have it if you need it you can have it it's yours it's yours if you want it you can have it if you need it you can have it it's yours it's yours it's yours it's yours
Depression can't have it. Sickness can't take it. Oh, it's mine. It's mine. I claim it. By faith I receive it. Stand on your word. Stand on your word. Yeah. Play off. Oh. You can shout about it right now. You can shout about it right now. It's already yours. It's already yours. Don't wait till the battle is over. Somebody needs to shout right now. By faith, shout. By faith, dance. By faith, praise him for it. Thank you for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Okay, we, we gotta go. We gotta go, because we, we're gonna come again tomorrow, and we're gonna do the same thing. You know why? Because this is who we are. This is what we do. See, there's other churches that used to imitate us, but then we started imitating them. I think it's about time for the apostolics uh, to be the leader in worship again, to be the leader in praise again. I don't know what you people are waiting for, but your miracle's here. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. You got a decision to make, okay? If this is who you are, and you readily admit it, you can live the rest of your life in the bleachers. I said you can live the rest of your life in the bleachers, wondering how much fun it is to give him praise, crazy praise, apostolic praise. So you can stay in the bleachers, but we gonna give you one more minute, 60 more seconds to get your praise on, your apostolic praise. Where you at? Where you at? Oh, I don't see, I see one usher. Come on, come on, before we leave, everybody gets a chance. Y'all not up here to look cute. You better get your praise on.
This is End Time Restoration 2019. I know my voice is shot, but I know that people have been delivered from depression, from loneliness. Amen? People have been delivered tonight, and I thank God for that. And I know, I know some, there are some people that are old, not very many, but there are some people that are old and we got to come back tomorrow. But it's usually the young people that can't get up in the morning. So, I have good news for you. We're scheduled to start at 10. We're going to start at 10.30 tomorrow instead, so you can all get here on time, okay? 10.30 tomorrow instead of 10. So all the young people, and thank God for all these young people, so we can get here tomorrow and start on time. If you want to keep going tonight, you can keep going all you want. Tomorrow starting at 10.30. Brother Sam Emery and Brother Robert Martin. See you tomorrow at 10.30.
your dance, with your dance, with your shout, with your shout. Everybody, 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 everybody. 